Father, we thank you for bringing us together. We thank you for the privilege it is to gather around your word. Uh, thank you, Lord, for uh, any guests and visitors we have with us today. Uh, really rejoice in that. And for all of us, Lord, whether we know you or don't know you, whether we're uh, walking with you or we're doing it tough with you or we're keeping it at arm's length, we pray that you'll give us all soft hearts that we will surrender to your call to live in your kingdom. In Jesus' name. Amen. Now, today's passage really reminded us that there are different ways of rejecting Christ. He said, you're either for me or with me or you're against me. And uh, there are three examples of categories of people who are saying no to Jesus. Those who are doing it bluntly by calling Jesus satanic. Those who are doing it subtly by loving J Jesus' mother more than Jesus. Uh, and those who are doing it by demanding a sign. So that's the rough structure of where we're going through this talk. But it really begins with Jesus casting out a demon that had caused a man to be unable to speak. Uh, the Bible doesn't normally link automatically disability with a particular sin or a, um, or a demon possession. But in this case, it appears the reason why this man couldn't speak was because of a demon that had taken hold of him. But the beauty of Jesus, who is so good, he refuses to abandon this man to either the demon or the disability. Look at verse 14. Jesus was driving out a demon that was mute, that is, unable to speak. And when the demon left, the man who had been mute spoke, and the crowd was amazed. Now, for the first time, perhaps, this man could finally praise God, as you praise God at the beginning of this service, with Chelsea Moon and that great band. Jesus, wherever he goes, drags a little bit of heaven, doesn't he? Wherever he goes, and puts right that which is wrong, heals that which is sick, restores that which is broken. But the story doesn't follow the restored man, you notice. It actually follows some in the crowd who now, keeping Jesus at a distance, wants to level charges against him. In verse 15, here is the charge. But some of them, and it was only some, said, By Beelzebul, the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. What they're saying is, in short, the reason why Jesus was so successful in casting out demon after demon was because Jesus was in league with Satan. He called Beelzebul, or Beelzebub, if you've got another translation. It was sort of a great name for a playtime group, you know, the Beelzebubs. But then again, maybe not, but maybe not so good when you think about it. Lord of the Flies, Prince of the Demonic World. This has got to be about the most ugly way of rejecting Jesus, as well as the most stupid way, calling Jesus satanic. I mean, that's about as wrong as wrong can get. That's calling white, black, right, wrong, good, evil. Uh, the one who is Lord over the demons knows exactly what they're thinking. <laughs> and he answers their charges. He does it in a couple of ways. He, he uses logic. He says, my paraphrase, you idiots. How can Satan cast out Satan? Because a kingdom divided against itself cannot stand. You need never attack a country that's in civil war. They'll implode themselves all by themselves. And no one knew that better than Israel because Israel was a divided kingdom. Ten of the twelve tribes had gone astray. Secondly, he says, if I cast out demons by the power of Satan, you're going to level that charge against me. What does that mean about your guys who try to cast out demons? I mean, they might not have been successful, but they were trying to do it. Verse 19. Now, if I drive out demons by Beelzebul, by whom do your followers drive them out? So then they will be your judges. Whatever measurement you charge me with is the same measurement that you'll have to charge and accuse your own followers. It's a ridiculous argument. And then he goes out and explains, it is not by the finger of Satan that I cast out demons, but by the finger of God himself. And already we're reminded, aren't we, that when push comes to shove, when you think about it, there is only two categories you can have. Jesus is very clear. It is time for decision. Jesus is either Lucifer or he is Lord. He is either Satan or he is the Son of God. Whatever varieties of views on Jesus, they boil down to one of two options. There is two kingdoms here. The kingdom of the light, the kingdom of the Son, the Lord Jesus, the kingdom of darkness. There is no other explanation. He is either one or the other. And he is saying in verse 20, if I drive out the demons by the finger of God, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. Because with the coming of Jesus, 
is the kingdom of God has come. Why? Because the king himself has come. And he has come to take control over evil that has run rampant in this universe. This explains why when you open the Gospels, there's so much demonic activity, so many demon possessions, but you don't see it in the Old Testament. It's virtually absent. A couple of examples, but very rare. Then you get to Jesus, vroom! Seems like every second man is possessed. Not, not so, but there's a lot in there. And I think the reason is, is because the king has come, the judge of all the earth, and Satan and his cohorts are absolutely terrified. In another occasion, when, um, when uh, the, the demonized man, the man who has many demons in him, they cry out, you know, do not torture us. Do not throw us into the abyss. And you get an insight of the fact that they understand that he's the judge and judgment day has arrived and they're terrified. That's why when the 72 go out proclaiming, preaching and casting out demons, they come back and they say to Jesus, Woo, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. We kick Satan's butt in your name. And wasn't that cool? He says, it is cool, but try to get excited more about the fact that your name is written in the book of heaven. And then Jesus, almost in like a vision of what's actually happening, as the kingdom of darkness is now being pressed against, he said, I saw Satan fall like Satan, like lightning from heaven. Though a vision of what's actually happening behind the scenes as Satan is being disarmed ultimately at the cross. What I'm saying is, Jesus is not just the head of another world religion. He's not just starting a new religion with some kind of noble truths, some wise sayings, you know, love your neighbour as yourself. Jesus is a king breaking in and overthrowing a kingdom of darkness. Satan is described in the Bible as the God of this age and the prince of this world. And this was happening not by the finger of Satan, but by the finger of God. And can I say, it was only by the finger of God. Because the temptation is to think that somehow there's no one stronger than Satan. If ever you've been exposed to raw evil, it is a very scary experience. Because Satan does have more power than you. You are, in a sense, powerless if it was just between you and him. But Jesus is breaking into Satan's world. And this is not like a battle between two heavyweight boxers going 15 rounds and you just don't know what's going to happen. Those of you who are my age, over 50, remember the uh, Joe Frazier, Muhammad Ali fights? Mate, they went for 15 rounds. You just never knew how it was going to end. That was boxing. Anyway, now everyone's in the UFC. It's not as much fun. Now, you know it's illegal to bet on a sure thing. I don't know if you realise this. You cannot bet on a sure thing. Well, you could not put your money on Jesus because he was a sure thing. There was not a one iota of possibility of Satan winning this battle. That when Jesus came on to take Satan, it was a lay down misere. He was not going to win. Jesus was. And that victory was finally climaxed at the cross when Satan was disarmed. Uh, because he could no longer accuse the brethren anymore, you see. Because the moment sins were paid for, Satan, which means accuser, had no ability to accuse his people because sins had been dealt with and he was stripped of his armory. Well, here, Jesus likens in a parable Satan to a strong man, and he uses the word strong man, who guards his house, inside of which are his possessions and no one can take them. But then Jesus introduces himself into the parable. He is the stronger man, the one who attacks and overwhelms the strong man, Satan, strips him of his armory and his weapons and takes his possessions. Friends, we are the spoils of that victory, are we not? That battle that engaged ultimately at the cross resulted in us being liberated from a kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of his son. Oh no, Christianity is not a nice religion for nice people. You will never get Christianity if that's what you think. This is a war. Every soul is a war zone. There is no neutral ground. Souls hanging in the balance and everyone needs to decide which kingdom they're a part of. The kingdom of the sun or the kingdom of darkness. Jesus says, you are either with me or you're against me. There's no third option. 
At this point, you know, I like to often quote the words of Bobby Dylan, one of his famous songs. You may be ambassador to England or France. You may like to gamble. You may like to dance. You may be the heavyweight champion of the world. You may be a socialite with a long string of pearls, but you're going to have to serve somebody. It may be the devil or it may be the Lord, but you're going to have to serve somebody and the options are reduced to one of two, Satan or the Son of God. You're either part of the solution or you're part of the problem. You're either sowing or you're scattering. It will do you no good to think that you're on neutral territory. And that's why I think Jesus speaks now about the unclean spirit that's cast out of the man who goes wandering and discovers that when he comes back, discovers that that body and soul is vacant, empty, cleaned up and available for re-entry. But what that demon does is he gets seven worse demons, more evil than himself. It's interesting. In the demonic world, some demons are even worse than others. That's interesting. I don't know what to say of that. And he brings his seven mates in and they take ownership of that body once again. And the final state is worse than the original state. Now, why does Jesus tell us this This. Explain, explain it that way. I think the point is, turn it, having a demon cast out of you will do you absolutely no good unless you turn to Jesus. What you can't be is neutral zone. Either Satan is in you or Jesus is. Turning away from sin, saying no to whatever addiction you have and not turning to Jesus puts you in, puts you in exactly the same spiritual zone. You're still in the kingdom of darkness. Now, you might be a nicer neighbour to have, because you're not, you know, partying at two in the morning with, uh, you know, with lots of drugs and stuff. You're not going to come over and bash my head. Yes. But all you've done is become a socially acceptable member of the kingdom of darkness. There is no third option. This is so, this is like a paradigm shift. You've got to think the way Jesus thinks. Because he is the way, the truth and the life. You know, in World War II, we knew that there were the Allies and there were the Nazis and those who supported them. And there was someone like a, team, a country like Switzerland that tried to play it neutral. Well, we've historically since discovered that a lot behind the scenes of the officials in Switzerland were actually siding with the Nazis and working with them. You cannot, you may appear to be neutral, but you are either siding with one or the other. And there is no Switzerland when it comes to the kingdom of darkness. Jesus says that the state, the final state of this person who has now had one demon leave and eight demons come back is actually a worse state. Now, what, what, what could be worse than having one demon in you? It's having eight. You know, Jack and his seven mates. Sorry if there's a Jack here. I didn't mean to liken you to an evil spirit, but I had to go pull out a name out of the hat. And what could be worse than having eight demons in you? It's actually spending eternity with those demons in the place of utter darkness. Because I don't know if you realise, the first reason why Jesus created hell, according to Matthew 25, is for the devil and his angels and those who want to side with him. The first reason wasn't for humans who rebelled against God, but was for Satan and the demonic angels who rebelled against him. What is hard to grasp is, is what the Apostle Paul says in Ephesians 2 verse 3, where he says... Every human being, Paul says, before we came to Christ, he, the Apostle Paul includes himself and every human being, Jews and non-Jews. Every human being essentially starts off, and I quote Ephesians 2.3, following the ruler of the kingdom of the air, at Satan, whose spirit is now at work in those who are disobedient. Well, who are the disobedient? He's not talking like Christians on a bad day. He's talking about those who refuse to accept Christ as their Lord and Saviour. Everyone starts off in the kingdom of darkness. So it's not about, you know, uh, about anything other than this. That's where I start. The question for me is, will I shift ground and become a follower of Jesus Christ? Will I shift kingdoms? Will I place myself out of the rule of Satan and in the rule of Christ? That's a shocking state. Like, I'm aware that what I'm telling you is thoroughly offensive. <laughs> but Jesus is saying it, isn't he? The shock of all shock, you know what that means? Is you can work for World Vision. Let's pick a really great organisation like World Vision. You can give your life to loving lepers in a leper colony. 
But if you don't accept Jesus Christ, you are in the same spiritual category as though you're an occult practicer and overtly a worshipper of Satan. You're exactly in the same category because there's only two categories. You're either with Jesus in a relationship with him or you're not. Whoa! I'm even offended by what I'm saying. Except for the fact that Jesus said it and I'll, I'll side with him every day. A dear friend of mine said, uh, I said to a dear friend of mine once, I said, how are you going with the things of God? Because I know they were thinking about becoming a Christian and uh, umming and ahhing. And the guy said to me, he said, Ray, I'm getting splinters sitting on this fence. <laughs> Ooh. Because in his mind, he thought there was somewhere in between the kingdom of darkness and the kingdom of light, you see. This kind of neutral zone where you kind of get to decide, but until you decide, you're neither one or the other. That neutral zone doesn't exist. That fence belongs to the kingdom of darkness. Now, sure, thinking about Jesus is better than not thinking about him. Being near the kingdom is better than being far from the kingdom. It just, you just need to know that until you're in the kingdom, you're not in. And you're in the kingdom of darkness. So I plead with you. And at the end of this talk, I will invite you to cross kingdoms, to side with Jesus and against Satan, rather than siding with Satan against Jesus. Because there is no third option on the table. Well, it's obvious to see that rejecting Jesus by calling him Satan is a clear way of rejecting him, right? But loving his mother more than Jesus is a much more harder category to grasp. Here is a woman who comes up to Jesus. In verse 27, she sounds like my mum. I love my mum. She said, as Jesus was saying these things, a woman in the crowd called out, Blessed is the mother who gave you birth and nursed you. Can you hear the accent? <laughs> the Jewish mother. Oh, to be that boy, the mother of Jesus. Oh, would be a wonderful honor. <laughs> oh, no, can you hear the accent? I can hear the Yiddish accent. Because she naturally thought, she just saw Jesus cast out a demon. Whoa. She's thinking the best connection point I can have with Jesus to be his mum. That's about the closest bond I can have with Jesus to be his mum. Now sure, uh, Elizabeth, the, mo the mother of John the Baptist, filled with the Spirit, declares Mary to be blessed amongst women. That's in the same gospel, have no doubt. Luke, who's writing this gospel, has already declared of that. Now to be fair, other women in the Old Testament have been called that as well. Um, but, but that is a great honour. That is a unique, precious honour honor given to one woman on the face of the earth to give birth to the son of God as a virgin whoa big honor many of us grew up uh, or maybe not many of us but a lot of us grew up uh, me included where we we just got trained to actually pray to the mother of the Lord Jesus how Mary full of grace the Lord is with thee blessed art thou amongst women and blessed is the fruit of thy womb Jesus holy Mary mother of God pray for us sinners now and at the hour of our death amen that's a prayer that we would have prayed uh, three times a week, I was the altar boy up the road at St. Aidan's. And, uh, and when we did the novena on Tuesday nights, we'd go to the full rosary and you'd do it 50 times. And, uh, and I've been staying at my mum's place, who uh, she's not been well in a couple of nights a week for the last three months. And uh, at the end, just before she goes to bed, I would uh, pray for her and, uh, and pray for the family. Then I'd say the Lord's Prayer, which uh, she was familiar with. And the moment I finished the Lord's Prayer, she goes straight into how Mary full of grace. And I thought... Now the question is, should I be praying that prayer with her or not? Well, the answer to that I think may be found in this passage because the woman comes to Jesus. This woman comes to Jesus and she's inviting Jesus to comment on his mother. Right? She's now given Jesus the opportunity to explain how we ought to think of Mary in her place within the kingdom of God. Because she says, blessed is the woman who bore you, whose breast nursed you. To put it short, will Jesus give a Roman Catholic answer or not? Verse 28 is what he says. The invitation is there for him to comment on Mary. This is what she says. He replied, blessed rather or instead are those who hear the word of God and obey it. And don't get me wrong, he's not putting Mary down. What he's doing, he's lifting everybody up. Everyone who loves the Lord Jesus He's saying, blessed rather are you. You might, ladies, you might have missed out on giving birth to Jesus, right? You and 50 billion other women on the face of the earth that have ever existed. 
You missed out on that unique honour and it is a unique honour. But she said, but Jesus saying, but you haven't missed out on the best of all because true blessedness, blessed rather are those, joyful rather are those who hear the word of God and obey. That as wonderful as it is to have Jesus in the womb, it's actually to have the word of Jesus in your heart is even a greater honour. You haven't missed out. Isn't that beautiful? That is beautiful. And, I, and I've said to my mum, I said, Ma, um, if Mary knew you were praying to her, I, I'll tell you this, if she knew, I'm not saying she does, but if she knew you were praying to her, she would be weeping in heaven right now. Because if you know anything about Mary, she is jealous for God's honour. She is a model disciple in Luke's gospel. She hears the word and obeys. And we are hearing the word right now. And we are being told that the greatest honour of all is not to have, Mary, to have Jesus in your womb, but to have his word in your heart. And can I say the tragedy is people are more concerned for Mary's feelings than they are for God's glory. And right now Mary would be weeping if she knew what was going on. So, you see how there are different ways of getting it wrong with Jesus? You can accept his power, but you can call him the devil. You can value his mother greater than you value him. But the third one is a surprise. It's those who demand a sign, a miraculous sign, before they're prepared to believe. Look at verse 29. As the crowds increased, Jesus said, this is a wicked generation. It asks for a sign, but none will be given except the sign of Jonah. For as Jonah was assigned to the Ninevites, so also the Son of Man will be to this generation. Oh, that is a, that is a shocking verse. This is a wicked generation. He's speaking to that generation then, but you can project from there. What makes it so wicked? What, what was wrong with them? Did they kind of molest kids? Did they sort of beat up on the powerless? Did they kick the blind? Did they you know, have a high abortion rate? Like what, what made them so evil? They wanted a miracle. They said, we'll believe in you if you give us a miracle on hand. Now understand, when are they asking for a miracle? Smack bang in the middle of a miracle. He just cast a demon out. That was a sign for them and all of us who look on. And what Jesus does then is he, he takes them. They ask for a sign. And can I say, if your faith rides on the latest miracle that happens, you will live an up and down Christian life. I'm telling you. Unless your faith is grounded in the once for all death and resurrection of Jesus Christ, on that resurrection then you will feel like you either have to kind of pretend that miracles are happening when sometimes they're not, because I believe miracles happen. But if your faith kind of hinges on that, rather than the death and resurrection, you will constantly live an uncertain life. Far better to build your faith on the death and resurrection of Jesus and treat every other miracle that comes as icing on the cake. It ain't the cake, it's just icing on the cake. Well, here is Jesus. Here is, here is this crap. They ask Jesus for a sign. What does he do? He takes them back to the Bible. He takes them back to two events in the Bible, one in the book of Jonah and one in the book of Kings. He takes them to our dear Assyrian friends, the, the ancestors of some of the Assyrians who are with us today in this congregation, and there are a number. And he says, those Assyrians who lived in Nineveh uh, got to repent when dropkick Jonah, and he was a dropkick, right? He didn't want to preach to them for fear that God would show mercy on them. He had to be dragged all the way to that city. And all he preached was, 40 days and you're gone. He didn't even preach repentance. He said, you're gone, guys. God's issued a judgment. I'm giving you 40 days. That's it. You're out. And they repented. Queen of Sheba, that woman from the south, comes and attends to the wisdom of Solomon and sits at his feet, sitting at the feet of God, and she too repented. And what Jesus is saying, he pulls these two stories out, and he says, you see these two stories, you know what they have in common? A, they're both non-Jews. B, they, they heard the word of God when it came to them. C, they repented when that word of God came to them. And D, is it D? A, B, C, D. And D, they did it without a miracle being performed. And E, they did it without Jesus being there. And then he says, what's going to happen is on the day of judgment, those people in Nineveh, those Assyrians, the ancestors of some of our people who are here today, on the day of judgment will rise from the dead, those who repented. And it won't be God pointing the finger at you for not turning to Jesus. It'll be those Assyrians from Nineveh. And they will say, shame on you. Shame on you for not coming to Jesus. Man, 
We, all we had was dropkick Jonah, who didn't want to be there, had to be dragged there by the scruff of his neck, and all he preached was 40 days of judgment, and we whole, from the top down, repented. But you, you got to hear about Jesus. You got to see him live his perfect life. You got to hear how he fulfilled every one of those 300 prophecies. You got to see him perform those, perform those awesome miracles. Shame on you. You got to see him die on the cross in fulfillment of Psalm 2 and Isaiah 53. You got to see him rise from the dead and appear on 10 different occasions at least over a 50-day period. You got to see him ascend into heaven and then send out his spirit on the day of Pentecost. And you who live in Rudy Hill, uh, sorry, who are gathered here today in the 21st century have seen 2,000 years of him doing his work so that now Christianity is the biggest religion in the world. And you're going to say no? And all we got was Jonah, dropkick Jonah for 40 days? I'd hate to be in your shoes. No excuse. See, in Christian economics, if I can use that word, there's a, or Christian, Christian, Christian accountability or judgment criteria, the more, it works like this, the more you know, the more you've been exposed to, the more responsible you are, the more accountable you are. Well, we're in a more responsible state than even those because when this story was being described, Jesus hadn't died, he hadn't risen, he hadn't appeared. They're this side of the resurrection. We're on the other side of the resurrection. It's all been laid out, then written in four versions of the Gospels so that you have absolutely no mistaking him. Can I warn you, friends, please? There are only two kingdoms. You start off in the kingdom of darkness, everyone. You've got to choose to go into the kingdom of the light. And for those of you who are in the kingdom of the light and think of walking away from Jesus... Tell you, those of you who grew up in Christian homes, who've been exposed to the truth, been nurtured about Jesus on your mother's knee, you decide to go walk about, you better pray that you don't want to die before you come back. Because you do not want to meet Jesus from a vantage point of the kingdom of darkness. Because remember, the reason why he created hell was for the devil and his angels and all those who side with him. So I beg you today, whether this, this is the first time you've ever heard this message or you've been hearing it for 50 years and you still haven't left the kingdom of darkness. Today is the day of salvation. Today is the day to make a decision. I plead with you and God commands you. Shift gears, move to the left and enter into the kingdom of, of the Son. I'm going to pray a prayer that gives expression to that desire to want to surrender to Jesus as King. To trust that he died and bore the judgment of hell for you so that you don't have to, who rose again for your forgiveness and calls on you to come to him. And as I pray this prayer, for those of you who are in the kingdom of the light and the kingdom of the sun, then I want you to, in your quietness of your own hearts, to be praying for those who are saying, want to take the hand of Jesus. But for those of you, and in a group this size, there will be a number of you who know, yike, there is only two kingdoms and there is no third option. And I'm in the kingdom of darkness. And I've got to shift gear right now. Then I ask you to join with me in praying this prayer in the quietness of your heart. Let's turn to God in prayer. Dear Father, I no longer want to be against you and side with Satan. But I want to be for you, Lord Jesus, and side against Satan. I recognise that it was my choices, my sins of rebellion my refusal to trust you, Lord Jesus, that brought me into the kingdom of darkness. But now, this day, this moment, is the moment and the hour that I choose to surrender, to abandon my loyalties to the kingdom of the ruler of the air and to side with you, King Jesus, once and for all. And I want to say thank you, Lord, for going to that cross for disarming Satan so that he can no longer accuse me of sins that have already been punished in the body of Jesus. I thank you, Jesus, that you bore the judgment in my place. I thank you that now that I have moved into the kingdom of the Son, I live with your love. I live under grace. I live in the freedom of knowing that whenever that day arrives, I will be ushered in to the presence of God. I thank you that now Satan has left me and the Spirit of God has now entered me. Help me to keep in step with your Spirit, 
to love what you love and to hate what you hate. And I thank you that the promise, that the promise that you have made, that the journey you have begun with me, you'll bring to completion, is a promise that comforts me. Help me to love no one and nothing more than you. In Jesus' precious name I pray. Amen. For those of you who prayed that prayer, welcome to the kingdom of the Son. And let's give them a applause. That's exactly what's happening in heaven right now for you.